are in listen only mode. This is uh, Joe Diamond from ASCAP, and I'm uh, reaching you from <laughs> the ASCAP offices in Boston, and it's my pleasure uh, to kick off this webinar, this first um, webinar and the kickoff of our uh, MassCap Training Center. I'm the Executive Director of MassCap, and uh, in a moment I'll be uh, introducing uh, folks who are working with us on the MassCap Training Center and our speakers. But I wanted to take this opportunity to welcome people to this webinar, to welcome the folks in our network and, and folks from the Department of Housing and Community Development to the webinar, and to say that we're really thrilled to be able to be doing this. Uh, this is a, a comprehensive training program that we are working on with uh, the department, um, and we were getting into more about uh, exactly what it entails, but it is um, the top strategic priority for MassCap uh, to um, create and conduct uh, a comprehensive training program. Today's webinar is on poverty, past and present. We're looking forward to this, being able to convey this information with uh, two um, important speakers today. We wanted to be able to start the training initiative with this information because it represents common and core and shared information that we should all have, information that both inspires and animates us as we do uh, our work. Just a couple of um, uh, things I wanted to note, uh, technical items before we get started. First of all, for those folks who are sitting in a group setting and participating in this and listening to the webinar, if one of you could um, sign in the participants and then somebody convey that to us, that would be great so we can know who and how many uh, participated. Um, further, if you look at the bottom of the, of the slide, you'll see the sound check note. And for those of you who may not be able to hear me, please use the chat window, which is at the bottom of the dashboard, uh, just to indicate that you may not or you cannot hear us. We haven't seen anything, so we're confident that this uh, that this is working. So without um, any further ado, what we're going to be moving on, that's that's me. That picture was taken this morning. I um, wanted to give you some quick background on the MassCap Training Center. It builds on our history of providing training, um, but kicks it up into a very intentional and comprehensive approach. It is, as I said, the top strategic priority for the association. Um, we are very appreciative of the, the underwriting from the Department of Housing and Community Development and from the Eastern Bank Foundation. What we've um, put together, actually we started in the fall, but what we put together stems from a survey of training needs uh, and feedback from MassCap members and from different staff groups, including human resource directors, um, CFOs, and planners. Uh, there is an advisory committee, which includes folks from the Department of Housing and Community Development, MassCap, and our agencies. Um, these, the, the trainings, the offerings that we have, and we'll go through um, a comprehensive list at the end of the presentation, those trainings sync up with uh, the national organizational standards quite intentionally. We want to be able to support those through this training as well. And again, um, it is comprehensive. I want to take a chance to introduce the MassCap Training Center team. Um, Paula Ho, Kathy McDermott, and Patricia Pelletier. Paula um, is our coordinator, and is our kind of our producer director today as well, uh, and we're really pleased that she's with us. She brings um, with her experience in developing and running a, a training initiative much like this. Paula, please say hello. Hi, good morning everyone. As Joe mentioned, I am the project coordinator for the MassCap Training Center, and as project coordinator, I am responsible for uh, researching resources to support the training center and our new course offerings, developing our training catalog, creating and sending out the email newsletter that you all have been receiving, and managing online registration for each of our trainings. As Joe mentioned, um, prior to joining the MassCap team, I worked for an international non-governmental organization where I oversaw the development of a training and professional development curriculum for criminal defense attorneys. And having worked in the nonprofit sector for many years, I'm committed to pursuing 
systemic changes, which will guarantee access to opportunities for all. I'm very excited to be a part of this initiative, and I look forward to working with you all. Thanks, Paula. Uh, next is uh, Kathy McDermott. Kathy is consulting with us, and we're lucky that she's joining us. Uh, she's a recently retired executive director from the agency in Fitchburg, Massachusetts Opportunity Council, and brings um, her experience along with the very important perspective of uh, a community action agency uh, leader. Kathy will be handling the questions today. Kathy, please say hello. Um, good morning, everyone. As Joe said, I was the executive director of the Massachusetts Opportunity Council, uh, which is the community action agency serving the North Central Massachusetts region for 30 years, retiring in August of 2014. Um, I know many of you, and I think many of you know that I believe passionately that the work we do is vitally important to reduce poverty and eventually eliminate poverty and make this a fair and just society for all. Um, in order to do this, we need a strong statewide network of agencies, so I'm really pleased to be able to assist in making the MassCap Training Center an effective and valuable training resource for our staff and for our boards of directors. Um, my role is to assist in determining training offerings, um, developing some training content, and developing some of the training. Um, this morning, I'll be handling the questions, as Joe said, so please feel free to enter your questions in the chat box at any time, and I will verbally ask the appropriate person the question. Um, I look forward to working with all of you as we implement this very important initiative that, as Joe said, coincides with the implementation of the national organizational standards. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. And uh, Patricia Peltier, Patricia or Pat, has been with us for, for many years and has been an important part of our MassCap team, uh, handling many areas of planning, uh, workforce development, program development, and implementation, and is consulting with, this, with us on this as well and has experience in training. Uh, Pat, please say hello. Hi, everybody. Um, as Joe said, I've worked with MassCap for a long time. Um, actually since 2000 and actually and with community action agencies for over 40 years in various capacities including designing, developing and facilitating training such as the MassCap job readiness curriculum training. Um, my duties at MassCap have varied but center around organizational planning and development. Um, Joe and I have been developing the concept of the MassCap training center for several years and my work with the MassCap Training Center since its inception includes developing processes, systems, and tools, and providing ongoing planning and development, as well as some upcoming course designing and facilitation. Um, in my other work, as the principal of, of Pelletier Consulting, I design and deliver training courses and webinars for the Mass Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed, Commonwealth Workforce Coalition, Sabes, and others, as well as providing planning and development for various nonprofits across the state, primarily in the areas of planning, development, education, and workforce development. My longtime vision has been to implement a training and professional development system with community action agencies in Massachusetts. So I'm really, really excited to see it unfold and can't think of a better way to do that than to have a webinar on poverty, past and present. So thank you all for uh, joining us today. Thank you, Pat, <clears throat> and thanks to the team. Um, we're going to move on now to the presentations, and it's it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, David Bradley. All of you know David. Um, he is our policy director. He's the executive director of the National Community Action Foundation and is tireless in his work uh, to craft policies and work with Congress and the President on policies that help the people that we serve. For more than 30 years, David has been one of Washington's leading advocates on behalf of low-income programs. In 1981, David helped found the National Community Action Foundation as a private nonprofit organization funded solely by non-governmental contributions. NCAP represents funding and policy interests of the nation's 1,000 community action agencies before Congress and the executive branch. So it's my pleasure to uh, turn this part of the presentation on the history of community action over to David. Thanks, David. Uh, thank you, Joe, and uh, thanks to everyone for 
for joining. It's uh, it's hard to talk the fifty talk about the fifty years of community action in the war on poverty, fifty one almost, uh, in just the two and a half hours that Joe has given me to uh, uh, to speak to you. But I'll I'll uh, I'll do my best. This administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. It will not be a short or easy struggle, but we shall not rest until that war is won. We we look back on on January 8, 1964, when when. Lyndon Johnson and the State of the Union declared a, a war on poverty as a seminal event, as the milestone kicking off uh, a very pronounced role by the federal government on improving the lives of its citizens, taking that responsibility. But actually the roots of greater federal responsibility go back uh, to uh, a time before LBJ, and that is the, the Great Depression. In the 1920s, if we ask who is responsible for the poor, the list would have been individuals and families and churches and communities and neighbor, uh, neighbors and local government, a little bit state government. But the Great Depression changed all that. And it added uh, two important elements into who's responsible for the poor. Number one was the federal government. And the reason that the federal government became responsible for its citizens, they're the only ones that had money or the ability to print money and pay for it. And second, we also saw in the beginning of, uh, during the Great Depression, we saw uh, the, the beginning of foundations, which is going to play a very, very uh, major role in our life. So I look back and I look at the 1920s. I look at Herbert Hoover's comments in 1928 that he felt that it would be possible to eliminate poverty in America for all time. The events of 1929 that everything came crashing down and the one-third of the nation ill-housed, ill-fed, ill-clothed. 25% uh, of the workforce was unemployed, and keep in mind that 25% was only white males that they were measuring. They weren't counting women or African Americans in the South. It was only 25%, so the real unemployment rate was close to 50%. When Franklin Roosevelt came in, this country was, was he came in under the, uh, uh, the real fear that a revolution, unless the government did something, a revolution was in the air and the country could either turn to the left, communist, or turn to the right, looking at, at what was going on, full employment in Germany that had a number of meanings. But Roosevelt said, we are going to take this responsibility. The federal government is going to be there on your behalf. That started a significant change in terms of how we look at, at poverty in America. The, uh, again, Great Depression, uh, New Deal, uh, as a seismic event that um, I, I laid the groundwork for uh, LBJ's initiative uh, some 30 years later. 1950s. Uh, it's it's a period that we look at in terms of uh, you know, history, the Donna Reed and the and the uh, Leave It to Beaver and suburbs and um, and just sort of a uh, a, a very very uh, mild uh, decade. Dwight Eisenhower was president. Uh, we had the interstate highway system, suburbs. Uh, at the space race, uh, people look at 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 the, at the 50s, and in a way that that misses the undercurrents, 
and the undercurrents of the 50s are very important to understand about why uh, forces came together in the early 1960s to launch this poverty initiative. And, and the, first, the first point is the civil rights movement in the 1950s. Whether it's Brown versus Board of Education, whether it's Rosa Parks in 1955, whether it's uh, Congress passing 1957, the Civil Rights uh, Bill, first one in 86 years, uh, whether it is Martin Luther King starting to raise expectations of social justice. That turmoil in, in the 50s that started was very, very important. So again, add to expectations from the decades of, of the 1930s, government would play a role. Now, now we have a uh, sizable uh, portion of our society saying, we need social justice. And all that uh, continues to build the pressure. Also in, 19, in the 1950s, two other things um, occurred that I want to mention. One is John Kenneth Galbraith uh, published a book, The Affluent Society, that really talked about the haves and the have-nots. And the fact that um, Society was was not um, lifting uh, all into economic prosperity. Uh, up even even in the Great Depression and the New Deal, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, assumed that if you get the economy moving and the economy floated again, uh, things would work out for everyone. And and in the 1950s, the awareness was was increasing that a rising tide was not lifting all boats, that people were being left behind. Also in the 1950s, and Joe, you're at uh, ABCD, I think, uh, uh, I think you are uh, today, the, uh, in, the, in the late 1950s, the Ford Foundation, yep, that foundation that I mentioned to, mentioned and uh, started in 1935 during the Great Depression, the Ford Foundation started looking at juvenile delinquency and school dropouts and started uh, figuring out strategies to address those needs and very quickly juvenile delinquency they linked to poverty and in the late 1950s early 1960s Ford did put out some seed money some grants the gray areas project to try to demonstrate that um, that some of these problems could be addressed more effectively at the local level. And the Gray Areas Project started again in the 1950s. ABCD was one, UPO in Washington, D.C. was one, Hartford, Connecticut, uh, 11 grants, these Gray Areas Projects said, we're going to listen to the low-income community on what their needs are. We're going to give them money that the low income, the community itself, can plan on uh, what programs they need to operate or design. They can run those programs. They can be in control, and if they need more than one, they can have a multi-strategy. But it's their money. It's local control to address local problems. That's a big difference from... FDR's approach on the economy in the Great Depression because those programs were designed from Washington. They were top down. Ford Foundation is saying we're going we're gonna to fund and experiment with bottom up. So the pace in the 1950s, the expectations primarily in the civil rights community on social, social justice, but America was awakening to the fact that uh, not everyone is sharing in the bounties of, of, of this society. In the election of 1960. A free society cannot help the many who are poor. It cannot save the few who are rich. President Kennedy, uh, he discovered poverty, uh, the first time he talked about poverty was May 1st in uh, uh, 1960 in West Virginia. 
he discovered Ap the Appalachian Poor. And Appalachia in 1960 is not too different than uh, West Virginia, is not too different than it is today, and that is primarily white, uh, family, rural, coal miners, 98% uh, uh, Protestant back then, don't know what it is today. But Kennedy was exposed to, to people that were really being left behind. And as president, as candidate, and later as president, he made a promise to the Appalachia poor that if I'm elected president, I won't forget you. That's the first rail of the tracks that we're talking about. The second, the second uh, rail is that the civil rights community, the civil rights movement changed, uh, morphed into social justice as well as economic justice. So Kennedy in 61 and 62 in 1963 is starting to feel pressures that the Appalachian poor are still left behind. And now he's getting pressures from the civil rights community that we need more than social justice, we need economic justice. One of the, I think, heroes in this uh, history of our, our program was a New York Times reporter named Homer Bigger. And Bigger uh, did continue to do stories reminding Kennedy that those in Kentucky and West Virginia and Southern Ohio and Pennsylvania still have not seen the benefits uh, of the Kennedy economy. So in 1961 and 1962, John Kennedy focused on foreign affairs. He focused on relations with the Soviet Union, the space race, other things. But by 1963, uh, his economic advisors were saying, Mr. President, the rising tide is not lifting all boats, and we're, we're leaving people behind. So in the summer of 63, Kennedy uh, instructed his administration to start looking for a poverty initiative to be included in his 1964 uh, economic message. So we have the civil rights movement, we have Appalachia, led, uh, reminded by uh, Homer Bigger. 1962, we had Michael Harrington's publishing his book, The Other America, of which Kennedy read the New Yorker article on it. But an out, a deluge of telegrams and letters to the White House demanding Kennedy respond uh, to that. So Kennedy, in, in uh, uh, the summer of 63, had his administration work on a response and how are we going to deal with poverty. And his last cabinet meeting in October of 1963, he approved uh, a poverty initiative. And I've talked about this uh, around the country, but at that cabinet meeting, Bobby Kennedy was there and President Kennedy wrote the word poverty on a legal pad and then underlined it five times in the cabinet meeting. Kennedy ripped that page off and threw it away. Uh, President Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy retrieved it and from the moment he was elected to the Senate uh, to the day uh, he died, uh, he kept that framed outside his, his personal Senate office as a reminder that President Kennedy would have, would have had a poverty initiative. But the Kennedy initiative that they were thinking of was $50 million spread over five years, was demonstration grants. Uh, it built upon the experience of the Ford Foundation. It would have been local. It would have been community action, but would, it would have been a community action uh, program on a very small scale. Uh, and contrast that in a minute or so with what with what uh, Johnson proposed. And with with Kennedy, the political battle was not among the poor. What Kennedy had to do, and as a cautious politician, he was cautious was to make sure that whatever he proposed was safe for the suburbs. And so it would have been a small scale demonstration program that allows for innovation, allows for testing, but also allows for failure. 
something doesn't work, close it down, try something else. But dollar-wise, about fifty million spread over five years. But the events of of, da of November 1963 changed all that. Now we have Lyndon Johnson, different political needs as as president, and um, and immediately the the suspicion from the Kennedy wing of the party was that Johnson's not one of us. So on <clears throat> on November 25th, uh, LBJ was informed about Kennedy's poverty proposal. And his response was, I like that. Let me know uh, more about that. The fact is, there wasn't too much more to tell him. There were some ideas, but there wasn't really anything firm. Johnson was immediately attracted to this. One, it appealed to the Kennedy wing. Two, it wasn't well known. It was a uh, Kennedy initiative that Johnson can take credit for. So throughout the uh, uh, winter of, of December of um, 1963, the Johnson advisors worked on developing the proposal. And what Johnson rejected early on was that he didn't want old line bureaucracy running this program, DOL or AG or HEW, uh, because it's going to be things off the shelf. He wanted something bold, something, something remarkable, and something big. He chose Sergeant Shriver to, to uh, pull all this together uh, because, first of all, he liked Sarge. Sarge was a good salesman. He sold the Peace Corps. Took the Peace Corps from an idea, a concept, and made it a reality and, and really worked Congress hard on that. Second, just in case this thing fails, I got a Kennedy in-law there that can share some of the blame, so he wanted to spread that out. But finally, uh, as you saw at the beginning of this, on January 8th, Johnson announced a war on poverty uh, to the nation. It marked the first time that America had declared a domestic war. We've had others, war on drugs, war on crime, war on cancer. But this marked the first time the president declared a war on poverty, uh, a domestic war. And in developing the plan, uh, Johnson rejected, then Shriver rejected the old, uh, old line bureaucracies. It took something new. Think Homeland Security in response to a problem. So they created uh, legislation called the Economic Opportunity Act. They created the command post, the Office of Economic Opportunity. It had three functions, uh, program administration, advocacy on a voice for the poor at the federal level and a laboratory, and a laboratory where it gave us community health centers and legal services and foster grandparents and uh, VISTA and family planning, many, many other programs, a laboratory that would try and experiment. Those were the functions. So Johnson uh, appointed Schreiber to head up this task force on February 1st of 1964, so Sarge tried not to take it. Uh, and by March 16th, the legislation was developed. By August 20th, 1964, the legislation was enacted. Eight months. Go back and think of how many years we spent develop, uh, debating health care. Look at other things like this. In eight months, the President proposed and Congress enacted legislation designed to wipe out poverty in America. One of the, one of the uh, um, aspects of this legislation is that community action became so controversial and was considered controversial. Keep in mind that the war on poverty was the centerpiece of Johnson's, or community action was the centerpiece of Johnson's war on poverty, which was the centerpiece of Johnson's great society. Community action came about uh, and was seen as controversial in one of the most confrontational, controversial decades in our history. We had the Civil Rights Movement, we had the Anti-War Movement, we had the Women's Movement, the Welfare Rights Movement. The country was in flames and community action was a central part of this decade. It's very much a factor of that. 1987, Ronald Reagan wrote in his, his diary that Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty is the source of 
all of our problems and every problem in America, which we took responsibility for. But one of the things that created the most controversy about community action was the inclusion in the legislation of the phrase maximum feasible participation. If you're the poor and you hear that phrase, maximum feasible participation, you're going to put an emphasis on maximum. Move over City Hall. We've got our rights. If you're local elected officials, you're going to put your emphasis on the word feasible. And yet, we paid the price for that, obviously. Uh, there was conflict, and yet it was intended. Uh, people knew that to break the cycles of poverty, to provide opportunity, was going to take controversy and conflict. We expect action at the community level. And when you've got action, you've got arguments, you've got dissent, you've got differences of opinion. That's what we're financing. For the first time in the history of this country, poor people actually have a place and a way in which to express themselves. That's community action. Anybody who thinks that isn't action, misplaces or misinterprets the situation, they think community action must mean community apathy or community torpor or community death. We're creating life at the community level. When you got life, you got movement, you got dissension, you got action. That's what we want. Uh, we're paying the price, uh, both good and bad, for Johnson using the word war on poverty. It wasn't an assault. It wasn't an initiative. And uh, it means victory. It means defeat. It means enemies and duration. Uh, it means success or failure. And, and the, uh, what victory is in the war on poverty uh, means many different things uh, to many different people. I know if you're a skeptic, it'll be, we, if there's going to be a war on poverty, then there should be no more poor people. Uh, we, we should end all that. Also implies uh, duration, resources, enemies. Who's the enemy in the war on poverty? It was a very controversial term. It captured Johnson's political needs, but I think for 50 years we're living with the consequences, the, cho uh, the choosing of that. Here's what Shriver thought success was in the war on poverty. Mr. Shriver, do you really believe that poverty can be wiped out? Yes, I do. Uh, I disagree with those who feel that grinding poverty the kind of poverty I mean is the kind of poverty where you have very bad medical care, very bad housing, very bad education. That kind of poverty does not need to exist in the United States any longer. It can be wiped out. Johnson wouldn't be president for life. 1968 was a turbulent year, uh, the year that Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were assassinated, also the year in which... Uh, LBJ was driven from the White House, and he was followed by Richard Nixon, and uh, Nixon, it's the Nixon we know. Uh, and here's Nixon in accepting the nomination on, on, uh, in Miami, 1968, Republican nomination for president, what he thinks about our poverty programs. For the past five years, we have been deluged by government programs for the unemployed, programs for the cities, programs for the poor, and we have reaped from these programs an ugly harvest of frustration, violence, and failure across the land. And now our opponents will be offering more of the same, more billions for government jobs, government housing, government welfare. I say it's time to quit pouring billions of dollars into programs that have failed in the United States. In Nixon's first term, keep in mind he barely won the election, 43% uh, of the vote, 1968, there was three candidates. Uh, they transferred Job Corps and Head Start. Job Corps over to Department of Labor, Head Start over to HEW. It started breaking up the Office of Economic Opportunity. But it wasn't until uh, Richard Nixon was reelected in 1972 by winning 49 states with the exception of Massachusetts and the District of Columbia beating George McGovern and Sergeant Shriver, that um, it wasn't until that occurred that he really turned his, the Nixon administration turned their fury 
uh, on getting rid of the Office of Economic Opportunity as well as community action agencies. The Associated Press reported today that the Nixon administration has devised an elaborate strategy for eliminating the Office of Economic Opportunity with a minimum of trouble from Congress. The AP said a technical staff paper prepared by OEO calls for, quote, completing the disagreeable business as soon as possible before opponents in Congress can develop a legislative counter strategy. This occurred in uh, uh, January of 1973. And uh, if you looked at the New York Times on January 27, 73, lead story. Front page, above the fold, right-hand column about Nixon going after this. Nixon had two, two great constitutional crises. One was this little thing called Watergate, and the other one that dominated the news was this, uh, the battle over OEO and the war on poverty. And uh, we don't have time to show, but, but dozens and dozens of nightly newscasts featured major stories on the battle over keeping OEO. Long story short, uh, Nixon left office. The um, Congress continued to debate two years on the future of OEO. The agency had accumulated too much baggage, too much lightning, too much damage. Uh, and OEO was replaced in 1974. It actually officially went out of business in um, uh, June of 1975 and became the Community Services Administration. Uh, downgraded, uh, less of a priority, no longer cabinet level status, and uh, the Community Services Administration uh, took its place. What was important is that the federal local relationship with community action agencies continued and that um, there would be uh, help in terms of uh, uh, continuing the innovation, the laboratory role. So around this time that weatherization and LIHEAP came about. So even though in the midst of a major battle with the President of the United States, uh, creativity was still occurring primarily at a local level. In Congress, led by Kennedy and Javits and others, Ed Brooke, Congress, uh, uh, although they wouldn't save, couldn't save the Office of Economic Opportunity, saved a lesser uh, agency, Community Services Administration, and protected community action agencies. Next slide. Change again, though. Ronald Reagan uh, and came in against, uh, totally against the uh, Community Services Administration. But they propose, and this is a payback for the 1960s when CAPS ran legal services in California. This was absolute payback time. Uh, and uh, Congress in, in uh, the early part of 1981 killed the Community Service Administration and literally reshuffled uh, the uh, domestic uh, policy deck. Tip O'Neill might have been uh, Speaker of the House, but he didn't control the House. Republicans controlled the Senate and, of course, the Reagan administration. It was in 81 that, that two New England senators, Republicans, Bob Stafford of Vermont and Lowell Weicker, of Connecticut gave me the opportunity uh, to propose to them the Community Services Block Grant because it wouldn't help save CSA. And it was in uh, early 81 that I wrote CSPG um, uh, against the administration. David Stockman, uh, Reagan's OMB director, used to say to the president that this is a CSPG is a program that we will eliminate uh, definitely this year. So we had 12 consecutive years of Reagan and then Bush 41 wanting to eliminate this program. Next one. <clears throat> What's clear to us is that um, Reagan, uh, the Reagan years, the Carter years, all going all the way back to LBJ, is that uh, the war on poverty or poverty or community action, for whatever reasons, some some because of fault because of ours or responsibility ours others beyond our capability, our, our responsibility. It was seen as uh, only a democratic initiative, that only Democrats favored uh, community action. So for 20-some years, we have really set out to develop a bipartisan base in Congress. LBJ, Ted Kennedy, you're not going to have, Chris Dodd, members are going to come and go, and it's important that both 
both uh, parties embrace this program. And one good thing about OEO or CSA going away and the passage of time allows us to build a bipartisan base. None more evident than in 1996 when Speaker Newt Gingrich reversed the contract with, with America and helped us increase, uh, substantially increase, funding for community action agencies. So when we can find systems that do work, we want to come out and aggressively support them, and that's what this press conference and that's what this initiative is all about. Glasio and I went to a Speaker Gingrich uh, several months ago and asked him to support an effort that was being brought forth by a number of Republican members as to, in terms of how we could help further expand successful efforts that are currently taking place across the country in some 98% of our counties in America. This network is known as the Community Action Agency Network and the Community Action Agency System. Although we're building a bipartisan base, not everything is uh, is bipartisan in terms of issues. And one one that I would just mention very quickly is the role of faith-based uh, organizations in social services uh, has continued to 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 be a major issue, a major dividing line between Democrats and Republicans, between evangelicals and more mainstream. And also competition for dollars continues to be an issue uh, in Congress uh, among lots and lots of programs. So it's a different different environment. It might be bipartisan, but there are issues that are partisan in nature that we have to work through in the next week. Not all the problems have been on the on the right. Issues have come up on the uh, 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 on the left as well that uh, we have to confront. This freeze will require painful cuts. Already we've frozen the salaries of hard-working federal employees for the next two years. I propose cuts to things I care deeply about, like community action programs. So we've had our problems with Republicans, our problems with Democrats. The good thing on, on both those fronts is that we work through them and we build from them and we listen to concerns and we build a bipartisan coalition. And through a lot of people's work, uh, these organizational standards, the, the administration uh, now gives a passing grade to the community services block grant to community action agencies as was evidenced uh, in their budget request this year. So the future is, we've got a new bill, a new bill that, that breathes new life into Community Action Network, and different than anything we've done in the past. It's a bill introduced by Republicans. It's a bipartisan bill. It has five uh, Republican committee chair uh, on uh, as co-sponsors of the bill. And so I look at, at uh, 51 years of history, what we've done well, what we've done needed to do better, uh, what the strengths were in terms of innovation and laboratory and local control. And we're able to, through all of this network, we're able to take those lessons learned, put them into a piece of legislation, and I think prove uh, once and for all that America's interest in fighting poverty, which was so pronounced in 1964 when LBJ announced, uh, announced his initiative, that that pronouncement in 1964 is more relevant today. And what Shriver and Johnson and others designed is more necessary and needed in our communities today than at any time in our last 50 years. So I'm excited about the future, and I love the opportunity to revisit the past. Thank you very much. Can they hear me? So. Thank you, David. Um, very inspiring. Go ahead. 
Um, I don't see any questions for you, David, from the attendees, but um, I have a question. Um, you talked a little bit about the future, and um, what I heard during your presentation was the word controversial an awful lot. Um, what do you see for the future for community action um, in terms of this new bill and in just in terms of going forward and, and being able to um, do the work that we know is so important to do? Well, um, the controversy with um, community action is, is part of our legacy and part of our heritage. Um, very few people in the network anymore were direct participants in the age of Johnson Driver, but we all are inheritors of that legacy. And community action was uh, controversial. Um, and it was sold in 1964 in a presidential year in a very, very partisan way. I, I think that, that um, the damage or the uh, injuries that were inflicted because of that controversy are long healed. Long, uh, long uh, past, and that is that is um, what we have now is is members in Congress, Republicans and Democrats, who are familiar uh, not with the 1960s and all and the raging uh, controversy. They're familiar with with trusted local institutions uh, that they've grown up with, that they've known, that their friends, their local elected officials trust. Um, so I see, for the first time in 30 years, no active pockets of opposition to the program um, in Congress. That's, believe me, that, that's a relief. Second, status quo, though, going forward, uh, is not going to be acceptable. Um, quality, outcomes, results, performance, transparency, absolutely paramount going forward, as well as innovation. Well, if we do it right, if we no longer accept that uh, an agency might be screwing up and having problems 40 miles up the road and it's their problem, not ours, we all say that it's all our responsibility. If we look fairly and honestly at federal performance, state performance, and local performance, and, and say to ourselves and each other, how can we do better? I think that we are on uh, the cusp of delivering a, a permanent bipartisan coalition in Congress, second, second funding that is secure and adequate. And that means increases. And third, uh, Kathy, what I think is very important to us is that once all of that is, is nailed down, then we be bold. We be, our, our agenda becomes ambitious, bold, and exciting. To me, what that means is there are programs that, for instance, Paul Ryan's talked to me about that, why don't we merge those with the community services block grant? Not to weaken our participation, but to give us additional responsibilities and recognition as well as resources. That we truly, truly try to become that uh, indispensable uh, institution in all the communities around the country. I think we're close to that. And it's taken us 50 years to get here, and it's meant that we have to be cognizant of where we came. But the future is awfully, awfully exciting. Thanks. Um, we did get another question while you were answering that question. Um, and this one might be uh, a quick answer. But um, it's at Caplaw, you mentioned uh, possible increased funding for the end of the year. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and yeah. where you see that going? Yeah. The uh, And I've, I've been talking about this all year. It's there's a two-stage process. One, um, the uh, House and Senate budgets, the, the agreement, uh, basically lived, uh, accepted, and uh, 
made decisions, funding decisions, based on sequestration, based on the deal a couple of years ago, and that is abnormally low domestic discretion. They won't work. Uh, the, the budget uh, that passed Congress increased defense with some phony money and puts tight, tight spending ceilings on domestic discretionary. President Obama has said, I will veto any appropriation bill, there's 12, unless we lift the caps, the spending caps for defense and domestic discretionary. Democrats are blocking any appropriation bill going to the Senate floor, the filibustering any uh, appropriation bill going to the Senate floor until we get relief. So the markups that have occurred, House and Senate, they're going to stop, they're going to die, and the process is going to break down. Our strategy was to make sure on that first step, even though they're marking up a bill in the House, marking up a bill in the Senate, uh, in the Senate, which they've done, to make sure that CSPG is not cut. That in, even though money is tight and programs are being cut, that we got to remain whole. We've accomplished that. And second, do it in a way that when a, when a deal is struck, whether it's in October or November, Harry Reid swears up and down it will be December. When a deal is struck and more money is available on the table for domestic discretionary, for labor HHS, to make sure that we've got our ducks in a row, that we can make the case successfully that CSPG deserves an increase. And so the, the year that I've laid out is unfolding the way I thought it would. Now the hard part, and that is to make, make sure that we can compete against NIH, against early childhood education, things like that, health initiatives, et cetera, that, we, we, that CSPG is seen in the light of a good quality investment for these precious few dollars that are going to be added to the appropriations process. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, there's a few more questions, but I think we should probably stop now because we've gone a little bit over. Uh, so, David, thank you so much um, for spending time with us, and thank you again for all your support and, and your hard work. Um, we know we wouldn't be where we are without you, so thank you. Well, Thanks, David. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and uh, I want to echo those those comments as well. We are we stand us in very good stead in Washington D.C. And thank you for the information. It's good for our memories to be refreshed, uh, and for those who have not heard part of the history before, I know it's it's very interesting and inspiring. Uh, I wanted to now move uh, to the the second presenter, Noah Berger, uh, who is a friend of ours here in Massachusetts. Uh, and soon his his screen will come up. Uh, he's the president of the Massachusetts Budget and Policy Center, and has been working for for two decades uh, and more uh, to advocate for, but to really provide all of us here in Massachusetts, in the human services community and the community-based organization community, with very credible and authoritative information about the budget and about the programs that emanate from it. In Massachusetts. Um, he is the president of Mass Budget, an independent research organization that produces nonpartisan policy research, analysis, and data driven recommendations focused on improving the lives of low and middle income children and adults, strengthening our state's economy, and enhancing the quality of life in Massachusetts. Most, most recently, we worked with uh, NOAA uh, on um, information that he presented at a, a forum, a symposium on poverty in Massachusetts. Um, where he brought people up to date on poverty in Massachusetts and uh, the causes, but also how we've been able in this state to help over 800,000 people uh, avoid poverty or lift out of poverty with the programs that, that work. So thank you, Noah. We welcome you, and, and please proceed. Great. Thank you, Joe. I just want to make sure, can you hear me and see my screen? Let's see. I, I cannot. Paul, have you moved over the screen? Uh, yes, I can see. I can see the screen. Okay, very good. Great. Um, thank you, and that was a great first um, presentation. Uh, very important history and, and well told. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit both about the details of poverty in Massachusetts and some policy issues that relate to um, 
the issues of po poverty and expanding opportunity in our state. But I'm actually going to begin with a little bit of a broader context to supplement some of the historical context that we just heard, because I think that the things that are happening in our broader economy are a very important context for what community action agencies can do in their day-to-day -day programming. And frankly, some of the big trends in our economy make it harder to do the work that community action agencies are doing every day. And listening to the history, I was reminded of the sort of dual roles of community action of being both program administration and you know, activism and changing the conversation. And I think that that part of the role um, is as important as any other. So I think thinking a little bit about the broader context is, is relevant for that discussion. Um, so just to look at what's been happening in our economy over the last 30 or 40 years, what you're seeing now is income growth at different levels of the income scale. You'll see that since 1973, low income people's incomes have actually gone down. Median incomes have been basically stagnant. And the only income growth we've seen has been among the highest income uh, wage earners or, or salaried employees. And that's the source of the inequality that we see around us every day. And some people might look at that and say, well, you know, it's unfortunate that we have inequality, that as our nation becomes wealthier, the low-income people do worse and worse, and middle-income people aren't making any progress. Maybe that's bad. But on the other hand, perhaps if we didn't have that kind of economic inequality, we couldn't have economic growth at all. So it's a price that we have to, that we have to pay. Um, well, there are empirical ways to determine whether that's true. And one simple way is to look back at another period in our history, that period from the end of World War II until 1973, when we had a very different kind of economy. During that period, we actually had strong income growth across the board. Uh, Low-income people had strong income growth, middle-income people had strong income growth, and higher-income people had strong income growth. So we know that kind of broadly shared prosperity is possible. And there are reasons why we had that broadly shared prosperity. Uh, during the New Deal, as was described, there was an effort to improve lives for everybody. One track was beginning a federal role in direct anti-poverty efforts. Um, but the other track was structuring our economy in ways that made sure that when the economy grew, everybody benefited. We had laws that made it easier for workers to form unions. We had strong regulation of the financial sector. Our trade and monetary and fiscal policies were largely oriented towards raising wages and incomes for everybody, and that had a real effect on what happened in our economy. Before I go on, though, I actually have to correct one thing or, or add one thing to the slide that you're looking at, which is if you look at this slide now, it looks like income growth was just higher across the board in that earlier period than it is in the more recent period. Uh, that's actually not quite the case, and you'll see why in a second. Um, the piece that's missing from this is the income growth of the top 1%. And that, I should say, is not wage growth, which is the data for the rest of this. It's overall income growth, because, of course, most of the income for high-income people in the top 1% is investment income, and it's not wage income. When we add that in, we get a slightly different picture. Um, we see two things here. One, overall income growth actually has been relatively close during these two periods of time. But the difference is that in the more recent period of time, virtually all the benefits of that growth, or certainly the lion's share of the benefits, went to the very highest income, 1% of the population. So our economy grew. It just didn't grow in ways that helped the bottom 95% of the population in a significant way. So what went wrong? Why did that happen? Well, I'll sort of do the big picture. I'm not going to spend a long time on this because there are a lot of other things to talk about, and we could talk about this for many hours. But that blue line there is just overall productivity. And as you can see, throughout the last 50 or 60 years, which is true through much of our history, productivity increases. Every year with technological change and people getting better at their jobs, we produce more goods and services for every hour of labor. This orange line that just came up is compensation, um, how much we pay people. And as you can see, for that first period, as productivity increased, wages increased. And that makes sense, because if somebody's producing 103% of what they produced the prior year, per hour, you can pay them 103% of what you paid them last year without creating inflation because they're being that much more productive. Um, as you can see, that productivity continued after the mid-1970s, but we see a very different pattern in terms of compensation growth over that period. And average compensation more or less flatlined. That is, the economy kept growing, but that economic growth was not translated into higher compensation. It was going more and more to, to profits. And I think a major challenge that we face going forward is what is it that we could do 
to close that gap again, to have the well-being and incomes of average working people continue again to grow with overall productivity. And that's largely a national challenge. And there are a lot of things we could look to at the national level in terms of fiscal policy and monetary policy and trade policy and, and labor law that would begin to restore that basic national commitment that economic growth should benefit average working people. Um, but I think it's interesting right now to look at the question of, well, what happened during that decade when we had both prongs working properly? During the 1960s, we still had that economy that in its basic structure was leading to wage growth for most working people, and we had the Great Society being launched. So we had a direct effort to drive down poverty as well as an overall economy that was making life better for working people. And during that decade, poverty in the U.S. went from 22 percent to 14 percent. That's very significant progress, a reduction by more than a third. Massachusetts never had poverty rates quite as high as the U.S. in, the, in this era, um, but we also saw progress here in Massachusetts. Poverty dropped from 12 percent to 9 percent over that time period. So when we had an economy that was working for everybody and the launch of the Great Society, we really did make very significant progress. What's happened since then? Well, it's very hard to fight poverty when even as the nation gets wealthier, low-income people's incomes are going down. In fact, the U.S. poverty rate in 1970 was 14%. Today, it's 16%. We are still in the aftermath of the Great Recession, so that's partly a cyclical issue, but there's been very little meaningful progress. Similarly, in Massachusetts, poverty is actually up over that period of time. Child poverty is a very similar story at the U.S. level, up fairly significantly since 1970. In Massachusetts, up in some ways even more significantly as a percentage over that same period of time. Um, that's the official poverty data. And as most of you, I'm sure, know, the official poverty measure is flawed in a number of ways. The two most prim prominent ways is the first is that the threshold doesn't really measure what it costs to make ends meet, particularly in an expensive state like Massachusetts. As you probably know, the poverty rate was originally set as taking a sort of a subsistence budget for food and multiplying that by three, and then um, inflating it ever since then without adjustments for actual costs or actual regional variations. Um, the other flaw in the poverty measure is it counts some kinds of income and not other kinds of income. So it basically counts cash income, pre-tax cash income. So it doesn't count things like um, the earned income tax credit, which is a uh, tax credit that helps low-income people. It doesn't count food stamps because they are non-cash. So the Census Department has a new measure of poverty that actually does a better job of digging into those numbers and both seeing what you know, actual people's lives are like in terms of being able to meet their basic needs, but also helps us measure more effectively um, some of the direct pro programs that we have to help reduce poverty. And when we look at the data from that, we see, as we saw, the official poverty rate is now 12 percent. If you were to set a threshold for what it actually costs to live in Massachusetts and then look at how many people um, have cash incomes that meet that standard, we see that poverty rate would be about 27 percent. That is, with a higher threshold that would be more realistic, we'd see that there are many more people struggling. Although that number still doesn't include the final step in the process, which is um, counting those sources of income that the poverty rate doesn't count, things like their income tax credit and SNAP food stamps. And when we do that, we see the, the supplemental poverty rate, this alternative measure from the census, is actually pretty close to the official poverty measure, but we get there by a different way. We can see that there are about 900,000 people who would be in poverty but for public programs that provide assistance to those people. The example is SNAP, food stamps, lifts about 141,000 people out of poverty. Earned income tax credit and our child tax credit lift about another 150,000 people out of poverty. Um, so I think the new measure allows us to see that things in terms of poverty would be much worse if we didn't have these direct programs that directly help low-income families. See the same thing in terms of children. There are about 200,000 children lifted out of poverty by um, these programs. And that's interesting because there are about 200,000 children in poverty. About one in six children is in poverty in Massachusetts today. If we didn't have government and public programs to 
help those kids, about two in six, or one in three children in Massachusetts would be in poverty. About 57,000 kids are lifted out of poverty by SNAP, and our tax credits lift about another 76,000 kids out of poverty. Noah, could I yeah. interrupt? Um, there is a question about how poverty is defined, and I think you've gone through some of the answer about talking about the supplemental poverty rate, but maybe you could say a little bit about how realistic do you think it is that we would actually change the official poverty rate to something more like the supplemental poverty rate? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's a large step forward that the federal government has actually recognized that there are better ways to measure poverty. So we now have an official poverty measure that is a more realistic measure. I think the question of whether it will be used to shape federal programs or state programs is going to take more time. And I think that to some degree, federal programs often use a multiple of poverty anyway. So things like our um, the Affordable Care Act covers people over well, well over poverty, in fact over 300 percent of poverty. So there are ways to get at that problem um, without having Congress change the official definition of poverty. But I also think as a long-term issue, it might be valuable to do that. It also obviously has regional variations. And uh, when there are regional changes, it always complicates things in a large legislature. So um, I think it's a step forward that we actually have a way to measure it and to be able to see the data. And some combination of that and setting thresholds for federal programs at reasonable levels, either through adopting a new measure of poverty or by setting them at some multiple of poverty are both possible steps forward. Thank you. Um, thanks. So just quickly, because I mentioned the EITC, the an important thing is sometimes not noticed in terms of programs that help raise the incomes of low-income families, although I should say I'm sure it's noticed by all of you, is that raising the incomes of low-income families doesn't just help those families immediately. There's more and more evidence that it helps the kids in the long term when their families have a little bit more income. There have actually been studies that show improved um, infant and maternal health when families have a little bit more income, better school performance and college enrollment when families' incomes go up a little bit, which you can do through things like internet income tax credit or a higher minimum wage, by the way. Um, increased earnings in the next generation, not surprising because kids are, are doing better in school. And ultimately higher social security benefits because when you earn more during your lifetime, um, you end up with higher social security benefits. So sometimes it's sort of a tension between efforts to raise the incomes of families and interventions that directly help low-income kids. And I think we see in the evidence that there's more and more overlap between those two things. You don't really need to choose. You probably should do both, and they have benefits that overlap and reinforce each other. Another way they reinforce each other, by the way, is things like high-quality child care for kids obviously are also a way to make it possible for low-income parents to work. So again, that benefit of the kids and benefits on the families reinforce each other. Um, next slide is just kind of to look at the question of, well, what if we had been able to maintain that kind of shared prosperity, whereas incomes grew, they grew at the same rate for everybody, which um, is the pattern we saw right after World War II but haven't seen more recently. Well, if incomes for low-income people at the 10th percentile had grown just at the rate of overall income growth, um, since 1979, instead of the 10th percentile of income being $13,000 a year, it would be $20,000 a year. Um, it's obviously a fairly significant more than 50% increase, and that would clearly have a direct effect on poverty. If our lowest income folks had incomes 50% higher, we'd have a lot less poverty in Massachusetts. And if income growth had been equal, it actually would have benefited most of the population. It wouldn't have been an issue of shifting money from middle-income people to low-income people. Middle-income people would actually be doing better off if income growth had been um, broadly shared. Same is true even at the 80th percentile. Really the place where income growth would not have been as strong if it had been at the same rate for everybody is at the very top. If income growth for the top 1% had been at the same 55% as it was for the overall economy since 1970, instead of um, the $1.5 you know, $1 million a year average income for the top 1%, $1%, their income would be about $650,000 a year. So we see again that the pattern we've seen is that our economy has grown, but the benefits of that growth have not been shared by many or most of our people. Let's skip this because it would take a long time to describe. 
Um, quickly, um, one important issue is to recognize that the problem of rising poverty is not a problem of low-income people not working hard to try to succeed. And in fact, the bar is getting higher. Back in 1990, people in poverty, family households, 56% had a high school degree. By 2000, 63% in Massachusetts had a high school degree. Today, 73% of uh, adults in poverty have a high school degree. People are working harder, doing the right things, but our economy is not functioning for them. So what do we need to succeed? And uh, this is a forward-looking part, and I think we know a lot of the, the answers to this question. Um, things like workforce development definitely help people to get and keep better jobs. Unfortunately, we've been cutting funding for, for workforce development, as we have been for much of the state budget. Um, we used 2001 as the starting point, partly because right before 2001, the state cut the income tax by about $3 billion, and as a result, has cut deeply into a lot of the programs that we know help um, people across our commonwealth to succeed. Early education and care, as you talked about, helps two generations. Again, we've seen fairly significant cuts over the last 15 years. Funding is down by about 24 percent since 2001. Higher education, of course, helps to expand opportunity for young people. Funding for higher education is down 21 percent since 2001. And that, of course, leads to higher fees and more debt for students who go to college and, to some degree, may deter kids from, from trying to go to college. Obviously, working people need to be able to get to work, and as we saw this last winter, when you fail to invest in your transportation system and you run trains that are you know, 40 years old, they're going to break down in the storms. And if our roads aren't maintained, people can't drive to work or they destroy their cars trying. No reason why a state as wealthy as Massachusetts couldn't have a, a transportation system that works for everybody, a world-class transportation system that would get people from where they live to where the jobs are. Um, when we think about those challenges, the things that we'd like to be able to do, to build a world-class education system, make sure all of our kids have high-quality education from early education through college and, and job training, and, and the other things that would help low-income people and middle-income people to succeed, those things all cost money. And there are basic flaws in our tax system that have made it hard for Massachusetts to make those investments. And one of the major issues is that the highest income people in our state actually now pay the smallest share of their income in taxes compared to the rest of us. That is, bottom 99% average, it says your tax rate, but it's overall taxes as a percentage of income. That is, if you add together income taxes, sales taxes, property taxes, gas taxes, everything else, most of us pay about 9.5% of our income in state and local taxes. The highest income 1% in our commonwealth pay about 6.5% of their income in taxes. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that which I could could, could talk about. A lot, a lot of it is some of our taxes are very regressive. Low-income people pay a larger share of their income in things like the sales tax than do higher-income people. That gap costs about $2.2 billion a year, which is to say that if our highest-income folks paid the same as everybody else as a share of their income, their fair share, we'd raise about $2.2 billion a year in more revenue, which would allow us to make those investments in the kinds of things that we know help to build a strong economy and allow all of our people to, to reach their full potential. Uh, we talked a little bit about the tax cuts, so I'm not going to go through those in detail, but they cost about $3 billion a year. Um, as we get towards the end of this, one issue that always comes up when we think about tax policy is how would it affect the economy? That is, if we make investments in education and transportation and pay for that by higher taxes, is that going to strengthen or weaken our economy? And, one way to look at that is to look at what's happened around the country. And I have to say there have been a lot of economic studies of this, and generally they find that investing in things like education and transportation is good for your economy, and that outweighs any negative effects of, of rates. But if we just look across the country at high rate, high income, high tax states and low tax states and see which have strong economies, we start to see a picture. Um, the chart you're seeing on the x-axis has overall levels of taxation from about 8% of income in state and local taxes to 15%, so low to high tax states. And the y-axis is our measure of economic strength, and it's median wages. Our, is the economy producing good jobs at good wages that can allow people to support a family? And the question is, is there a correlation here? And if you look at it, it shows very clearly absolutely nothing. That is, 
you can see those boxes are scattered all over the place. Some of the low tax states have stronger economies, some weaker, same in the middle, same towards the upper end. There's just not much correlation at all there. Now you might look at that and say, well, there'd never be a clear correlation between any one factor and um, 50 different states because there's so many different things going on. Well, one other factor to look at is education. You just ask the question, do better educated states, states of better educated workforces have stronger higher wage economies? And here the y-axis is the same, x-axis is a percentage of the population with a college degree, so from less well-educated to better educated states. And when you look at that, you actually see an incredibly strong pattern. That is, um, the lower, less educated states uniformly almost have weaker economies, and the better educated states have stronger higher wage economies. You'll notice there actually are two outliers up in the upper left, Alaska and Wyoming. If you have a lot of oil and very few people, you don't need a well-educated workforce to have a strong economy, but everybody else does. And I actually find it striking how tightly grouped around that line everybody else is, how strong that correlation is, and also how big the differences are from you know, $14 or $15 average wages to $19 or $20 average wages. And when we think about economic policy, often people talk about a whole lot of other stuff, from you know, corporate subsidies to regulatory environment to overall tax levels. Well, there are not states that have magically found a way to take a poorly educated workforce and through some other set of economic policies, other than finding oil, create a high wage economy. There's nobody in that upper left hand quadrant. The way that states build strong high wage economies today is to have a well educated workforce. The one thing I'd like to say about this last thing is if you look where Massachusetts is, it looks like we're in an enviable position and compared to the rest of the country, we are with 45% of our population having a college degree in one of the highest wage economies in the country. I think the lesson from that is not to pat ourselves on the back and say we're doing fine. It's to ask, well, what would happen if 20 years from now or 30 years from now, rather than 45% of our population with a college degree, that was 60% or 70%, and, and if the rest had a good post-secondary credential of some kind to help them get a good job, what would our economy look like then? And obviously the economy would be much stronger and much more inclusive with greater opportunity for more people. And then the question is, well, how do you get there? And that's obviously a long discussion, but at the core of it is what do we need to do for that half of our population that's now not getting a college degree? And part of it is probably making higher education more affordable, improving our K through 12 school systems. Um, but for a lot of kids, it starts much earlier than that. High quality early education, making sure kids have access to adequate nutrition and health care and mental health care, and if they're involved in our foster care system or, or juvenile justice system, that they're getting put back on the right path. And basically everything we do to improve the opportunities for low-income kids and, and the incomes of their families, which we've seen are, are crucial to um, giving them that kind of opportunity in their lives, all of those things that we know are probably the right thing to do for a society that believes in opportunity are also probably the best thing we can do in the long term to build a stronger economy for everybody, for our entire state. Um, now the state actually has made some important progress in the last couple of years, and I think it's important to recognize that. One area is the minimum wage. There was a bad news story that ended last year, or had a nice U-turn last year. The minimum wage back in 1968 for a full-time worker was $21,000 a year. By 2014, the minimum wage for a full-time worker was $16,000 a year. So even though the nation is much, much wealthier in 2014 than 1968, incomes overall are much higher. We were actually paying our lowest wage workers significantly less once you adjust for inflation. Um, it's interesting to see what the minimum wage would have been if it had grown at different rates. If it had just been indexed to inflation in 1968, it would be about $11. If it had been indexed to worker productivity, if it went up by the same amount as our productivity went up, it would be $15 an hour. And if it had been indexed to CEO compensation since 1968, everybody can guess for yourself before I show this, but the answer is minimum wage would be $63 an hour. Um, the good news is Ma Massachusetts last year did increase the minimum wage in phase steps up to $11 an hour. That's going to directly help one in five people in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And that's a fairly important change in the lives of low-wage workers. And I think it's important also to note that that happened because low-wage workers all across the state organized to make it happen. 
that is through grassroots organizations and labor unions and faith-based organizations. People organized to put a question on the state ballot to significantly increase the minimum wage. That drove the state debate. The legislature eventually responded by passing a law that had a very large minimum wage increase. I think that's strong evidence that things are far from hopeless. When people organize and work together, they can make big changes, in this case, helping one in five wage earners in the Commonwealth. A very similar story happened on earned paid sick time. Um, as many of you may know, currently about a majority of low wage workers don't have earned paid sick time. That is, they don't have paid sick time. It's a little bit less bad for medium, it's actually much less bad for medium and upper income workers, but that's a significant problem for low wage workers. And for many of them, they don't just not have paid sick time. A lot of low wage workers don't have sick time at all, which means if a low wage worker calls into her employer and says, I'm too sick to come to work today, um, the employer could simply say, too bad, you have to come in anyway or you're fired. That um, people did not have that basic right. Um, again, people organized, put a question on the ballot, voters voted in favor of it, and beginning July 1st, that is next week, um, every worker in Massachusetts will have the right to sick time. People will no longer be able to be fired for being too sick to work or if they have to care for a sick child at home. Um, and for every worker at an employer of 11 or more employees, people will get paid sick time. That is, people won't miss a day's pay if they're too sick to work. And for low wage workers, where every day's pay is important to paying for things like food for your family or paying the rent or your kids' clothing, that's a fairly significant change. And it's a change that happened last year because people in Massachusetts worked to make it happen. Um, I'm going to wrap up now, and I'll close with a quote from Lyndon Johnson um, and this was right in that period that was described in the earlier slide of the, the earlier presentation of the transition from Kennedy to Johnson. The quote was actually from Lyndon Johnson's Thanksgiving Day address in 1963, about one week after President Kennedy was assassinated. And it obviously had a particular resonance then, but I think in a broad way the message is as true today as it was when he, when he said it. Yesterday is not ours to recover but tomorrow is ours to win or lose. Um, and I think that's the challenge that all of us face, that there are definitely things that we could do to expand opportunity, to reduce poverty, to make Massachusetts a much better state. You are all at the forefront of that fight, and um, I think we're all grateful for the work that you do, and just encouraging you to, to keep moving forward in both addressing the immediate challenges that you see in your communities, but also um, working on ways to improve our Commonwealth overall and, and strengthen our economy in ways that expand opportunity for everybody. And I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Um, I don't have any other questions that have come in, Noah. Um, okay. I guess I would ask a question about the minimum wage. Yep. I think now there's, or I think there will be very soon, a campaign to raise it even more. Um, to $15 an hour, I believe. Um, do you think that that is realistic? Uh, what do you think would be the chances of that happening? Um, I think that's an interesting question. I think that, I mean, you saw if the minimum wage had just been indexed to productivity, it would be about $15 an hour today. So I think from an Correct. economic point of view, I think it makes a lot of sense to think about what the right minimum wage should be. Clearly, it costs more than um, $11 an hour to raise a family in Massachusetts. So I think that that is going to be a very live fight both in Massachusetts and around the country for the next several years. And as you may know, many of you may know, a number of states have already adopted $15 minimum wages. So we can begin to see what the effects of those kinds of increases will be. The final thing I'll just add is um, Mass Budget exists to provide information and um, analysis and research on issues that affect low-income people. So Anytime we can be helpful to any of you out there, please don't hesitate to give us a call. We're happy to come make presentations, but also just to answer questions that you may have about any of this information or anything else that affects low and middle income people in Massachusetts. Thank you very much, Noah. We, again, very much appreciate the information that you have provided and provided today. Um, what you provide to all of us in the state helps us frame our our understanding and approach to fighting poverty and to shared prosperity. Uh, that concludes the presentations. I just wanted to take a minute to move on 
uh, to give you all a sense of um, where this fits into the overall MTC uh, effort. As you can see from the screen, um, we have several offerings coming up over the next several months. Um, this summer, soon in July, a data visualization um, workshop uh, in, done in conjunction with the Mel King uh, Center or the Institute, um, UMass, and Tech, Network, Tech Networks. Um, as you can see, we're moving into the fall with offerings that are designed for both board members and executive directors and staff, which include strategic financial management, a new executive director orientation, financial operations and oversight, um, organizational risk, customer satisfaction, and grant writing. And then in the winter, we look forward to additional offerings uh, supporting um, our abilities to budget and plan and manage, um, supporting um, the understanding of boards related to their uh, roles, expectations, and legal responsibilities, the board executive director relationship, soft skills to maximize job performance, effective performance evaluations, accommodations, and leave, and then um, a piece about data management. Uh, all of these and more um, constitute what the MassCap board uh, has asked for, which is a comprehensive and robust uh, training initiative in Massachusetts for the community action agencies, again, working in conjunction with the Department of Housing and Community Development. So thank you again to everybody who's participated, to our presenters, to the MassCap Training Center team and to those folks who are participating um, at their community action agencies and at the department in this webinar. Um, a link to an evaluation will be sent and we please provide us with your feedback. That's incredibly important. Um, we've, what we've developed so far has everything to do with the feedback that we've gotten about the offerings and about the process. So please help us with this one. Um, also watch out for the MassCap Training Center newsletter for registration information about the upcoming offerings. Uh, if you'd like to, to sign up for it, if you don't already get it, please uh, contact Paula Ho at her email, which is on the screen. Um, I want to thank Paula for being our uh, director and producer today, um, for helping us to move seamlessly from presenter to presenter. Uh, any further information you might need, please feel free to reach out to her or to me um, at MassCap. This webinar was recorded and we will soon uh, provide information about how you can access it uh, later on at your convenience. So with that, again, I want to thank all of you for participating, uh, and we look forward